This is the 2.5, Conversations Connecting Innovators. My name is Klaus. Finding new podcasts and starting conversations around episodes you loved is no easy feat. One service I found is working on filling this void. I found this platform through one of the industry's newsletters I follow. Podchaser helps discover new podcasts. I started using it, liked what I saw and reached out to them for a conversation. I have reached Cole Raven, the co-founder of Podchaser, while he was traveling to Hawaii. Incidentally, a place I have very fond memories of, since I learned flying and received my private pilot's license on Oahu. We talked about the value of platforms for discovery and community building, about remote teams, long-time friendships and new friends found on Reddit, and about serendipity in innovation and startup. We also talked about remote companies, worldwide hiring, tools like Slack and Basecamp, building communities, about building a podcast platform, sharing data and credits, a growing central database for podcasts, and about fundraising in the podcasting world and new features coming along. Enjoy the conversation. On a scale of 1 to 10, you and your co-founders, how much of a podcast nerd are you guys? <laughs> I think it, it kind of depends on what you mean by pod, podcast nerd. Um, so like I, I don't make any podcasts uh, myself. We, we do have a couple of people on our team who produce and, uh, and have, have been making podcasts for a while, but um, I'm just more of an avid listener and I look for things to listen to in, in my niche. I would say, As far as being a podcast nerd goes, I'm I'm probably more in the middle. Um, I'm not, you know, I don't know a whole lot about the different you know kinds of recording equipment out there. I know more about like the listening apps and things like that. So I'm a nerd when it comes to that. But the other people on our team are definitely uh, super nerds, 10 out of 10 when it comes to <laughs> when it comes to the rest of the stuff that's that's over my head. Okay, uh, what would I find when I talk to? Uh, to people that do podcasts, work around podcasts, that most of them love to listen to podcasts. Also, it's it's a very important thing in their life, and um, and um, I'm I'm really thankful for you guys that you you started Podchaser because it helps both sides of these of the, this equation. It, it helps so much to, to uh, show a podcast, to promote a podcast, to, to um, be reached, um, to, to reach out to, to an audience. But it helps also for me as a listener to, to uh, discover new podcasts. I, I think that's perfect. It's a perfect win-win situation. Yeah. Yeah. I, I completely agree. <laughs> <laughs> Cole, you're the co-founder of Podchaser. You are an entrepreneur originally from Indianapolis. You're currently traveling a lot for a long time. You are working for a company that you have co-founded that works remote from everywhere. Uh, that is located in Lowell, Kentucky. <laughs> uh, how was my pronunciation? <laughs> <laughs> I had, well, uh, I had to think for a second about what you were trying to say. So to try, try it again. Try it again. <laughs> Louisville. <laughs> that's Louis Louisville, Kentucky. Some people Louisville, say Louisville, Louisville or Louisville. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I um. Well, it's difficult to pronounce, I guess, for at least for people not from that place. Uh, so, so you're actually uh, living a life right now that is uh, based on traveling. You're doing some sort of traveling adventure. Where are you right now in on this trip? Right now, I'm in Maui, Hawaii. Um, I'll be here for another month. We've been here since, let's see, what's today? It's November when we're recording this. So we've been here for two months. We'll be here for a little over a month after that, and then we'll be Back home for the holidays. Uh, we'll be home for three weeks with family and then probably Arizona next. You said that your company is also set up. 
in a way that you can do all the work remote. Your co-founders are basically spread out across the world, some in Australia, some in the US. There is, there, I suppose there will be more uh, uh, um, people working for Podchaser in the future from all way, uh, corners of the earth. And uh, so you're simply setting up your company in the way that it fits your travel adventures, but that it, it that you find the best people from all over the world, I guess. What's the plan behind yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, I mean, you point out something that's very important, and that's just having access to people all around the world. The, the talent pool of people that we're able to, um, able to draw from. So whenever we make a job posting online, we can post it to anybody in the world, this job opportunity is open to anybody. It doesn't matter what country you're in. Um, you know, as long as we can communicate with you, we, we do all of our work just over Slack online and, you know, we do zoom meetings so we can see each other face to face, um, in that way. But yeah, it just, it gives us access to a talent pool that we wouldn't otherwise have. And if we limited ourselves to, you know, sticking our headquarters in like San Francisco or in New York, um, we would be limited to, you know, people who live there and that's, it just doesn't make any sense. And, and with today's technology, you know, we, we think that, uh, especially with the types of roles that we're hiring for, it's, you know, things like, things like engineers, these people are very autonomous. Um, it makes sense to work asynchronously where you can communicate when you need to and put your head down and get your work done, um, on your own time. And we just, you know, give people, um, give people the option to do that. And, and it's, it's been great for the people who are on our team. I know it's not, it's not the perfect fit for everybody. Um, but yeah, that, I think that's a big advantage of, of being, uh, where we are today as a startup, because we have to be capital efficient. We have to think about, uh, like we don't, we don't have, we don't have money for like $10,000 a month in rent. It just doesn't make sense. You know, it makes more sense to spend that $10,000 on, you know, talented people to join our team. Mm, I, I see. I, I like that system a lot. Um, I do a lot of remote workshops also, and there's the software, there's the, the tools, there's uh, Zoom as a, as a very important tool also. There's good examples uh, like the company that created Basecamp, the project management tool. For me, they're, they're right, like a, uh, the perfect example to do the remote company. Yeah, yeah. I know I've listened to actually a few podcasts, I think, with... Uh with one of the founders um, and that, you know, stories like that inspired us to do it uh, because you don't, I think that people are thinking about it more, but even when we started this company, you know, three or so years ago, um, it's, it was just now becoming uh, a normal, a normal thing. Mm -hmm. So it took a little bit of a leap of faith, but now I'm hoping that people hear stories like this and they're more willing to do it. Do you have like a tip that you can share? Um, where you think it, uh, you, you have chosen something, a, a great tool or a great way to do X, Y, Z? I think something that, something that we started as a company early on was, and it's not, you know, just saying, saying that we use Slack is, is one thing, but I think the way that we use Slack is very important because from the beginning, when we started Podchaser, we wanted feedback from the community on how to build the product. So we have our internal Slack channel where everybody on our team can can communicate. And then we have a separate Slack channel that's for the Podchaser community. And there's almost 700 people um, in there who, who do things like request new features and even report bugs. And it gives them a direct line of communication to our founding team. And we think it's much more efficient than uh, having, a, having an inbox full of emails from all of our users. We can have all of the conversations in one place. The other users can see our responses to those conversations. And uh, it just makes us more transparent and open as a company because people can publicly ask questions or publicly post when things are wrong. So then we you know, want to urgently fix it. So I think that it's good for accountability and transparency and, and helps with communication with our users. And then we build, that's how we built Podchaser from the beginning is just based on feedback that we've heard from podcasters and from uh, from listeners hoping to discover new podcasts that fit their interests. So mm -hmm. um, I think that's that's one thing that I think that we've done really well. Mm. So it's the Swiss Army knife of um, digital communication Slack that is sort of your company is, is built on or relying on totally. Yeah, I have Slack open on my phone and on my computer. Uh, 24 hours a day. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I'll include the link to that uh, uh, Slack channel that you mentioned in the show notes uh, because I think that was a, that is a very interesting thing of being in touch with um, your users, your customers, your clients, your partners, your uh, to improve something very quickly or to give it also the feeling that um, for especially the people that have most that put most energy and ideas into such a thing uh, and give you feedback and it's you you drain this energy if you don't react if you don't give the people that give you ideas uh, a, a quick heads up for example or some re some response yeah definitely i yeah i i think you know i've i've always been frustrated with companies where you uh, send an email to like support at whatever and then you get an email response that's just a generic like link to a help uh, help link on their website or something yeah. you know, that's it's so frustrating when um, you know in today's in today's world you know people don't want to hear when they call a customer support line they don't want to hear a robot on the phone you know they want to immediately talk to a person so we hope to we hope to always be like that we hope to always give people a direct line of communication to, to yeah. our team. Uh, I think this is really important because the, the these emails you mentioned often come from an email address called no reply at whatever company dot com. And I think that says a lot about the way they want to actually communicate with uh, partners, with clients, with users. And I think that says a lot about also uh, the way they want to have a community or build a community. And by the way, this was one of the major things that drew my attention to Podchaser also. I discovered um, Podchaser uh, via uh, podcast movement and uh, signed up and, and uh, started using it. And then I discovered that you do lots of really nice community work on Twitter and Facebook, for example. I was really impressed by that because it's very, very normal, very funny, very intriguing. It, you're geniuses, yeah. I think. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. That's really, uh, you know, we, we recently brought on somebody on our team uh, named Dave, who has really taken over all of our social media. You know, we've been active on social media for a while, but I think that um, he's really figured out what strikes a chord with podcasters and with listeners and uh, asking asking the right questions to get people thinking and get them engaged. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really, honestly, even it's, it's blown me away because, it, you know, we'll post, uh, we'll post something like, I can't remember what it was he did recently. I think it was like describe your podcast in a GIF. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, there were like 400 comments or something. You know, it was, you know, people uh, people get really excited to, to talk about and share their their own podcasts with the world. And, you know, I think that we've just um, been able to been able to communicate with people well in that way. I think mm -hmm. it's worked out. You know? My favorite is aliens, aliens exist and they like podcasts. It's just, I would have never thought of anything like that at all. I'm not even a big space or whatever aliens fan. Uh, I just I just like this a lot. Um, so you, that way you, you build a community. I, I think that's very, you create enthusiasm, you create like uh, a, a group of followers that care for your service a lot. And I think that's also very important because um, the main uh, a, a central idea behind Podchaser is that uh, you gather information automatically, which any podcast uh, uh, platform can do um, because of the way podcasts run. Uh, but uh, you rely heavily on um, uh, information and user interaction that, that actual people put in, in on the platform. Yeah, so, so that's something that you only do if you like the product, for example, if it has a big advantage for you. Yeah, we, we've really from the beginning focused on things that we can build to help, especially the independent creator, because it's, it's difficult whenever you create a new podcast to get your podcast in front of the right audience. And we recognize that from the beginning because we have a couple of people on our team who make independent podcasts and you're not a part of some big network like iHeartMedia or, uh, or Westwood One or, you know, something that's some sort of existing engine that maybe came from the radio space 50 years ago. So they already have a network to promote it, like on their radio station or on their, on their website or on their social channels that already have hundreds of thousands of followers. 
So you're really kind of starting from square one as an independent podcaster. So built tools, we hope that uh, help help the independent creator share the word about about their podcasts and and you know get get more listeners. You know that's why we think that things like the individual episode, the episode level ratings and reviews are so important because you can ask for feedback on a specific episode and then we'll add the ability for you as a podcast creator to actually respond to those reviews. So that's something that's being developed right now that we think is, that we think is important because uh, first of all, whenever, whenever you as a, as a podcaster ask for things like go rate and review my show on, on Apple um, that's, First, for listeners, that's a really hard thing to do. I don't know if you've ever rated a podcast um, in in Apple, but it's not easy. It's not intuitive, mm-hmm. and doesn't affect your rankings at all. So you could have five thousand new five star reviews, and if people aren't subscribing to your show, then nobody's going to discover it. So I think there are just some things lacking in the existing um, infrastructure for ratings that influence discovery that we've tried to leverage from the beginning that we think are interesting. And I think that it's, it's been really helpful because it, out of all of the users on Podchaser, the, the largest percentage are podcast creators. And I think that that's a good thing because uh, as we continue to build features, that means that they'll encourage their listeners to join Podchaser and then their listeners can, can find other, other interesting shows too. And mm-hmm. podcasters, podcasters are also listeners. <laughs> They're probably the, the most active podcast listeners. If you're making a podcast, that means that, uh, you know, you've, you love the medium enough to think that it makes sense to, to spend so much time, um, creating and building something to contribute to, to, to it. So that was also my impression. Um, there's, uh, like a learning side of listening to other podcasts, Uh, but there's also the fun side and uh, the information, the ed- education, the whatever side, the, the being uh, entertained side. I understand uh, the notion to do to proceed like that uh, a lot. And also what is so important is to have a platform that is um, platform independent. Um, I'm an Apple user, but 70% of all the smartphones out there are uh, Android. So they would never have access to Apple Podcasts at all. And I understand that it's very important to have a, a platform that works for basically everybody. And that's why I like uh, Podchaser so much, because you pick up these basic needs for podcasting creators and audiences. Like, I, I don't have an iPhone either. I have a, a OnePlus 6T phone. And so when every single podcast I listen to says, go rate, rate and review my show on Apple, you know, I... I'd love to help you out, but there's, I can't, I can't do anything for you. (laughs) Um, so yeah, that's why, that's why we're trying to build this cross platform solution. So you'll start to see Podchaser ratings appear in all of the popular, um, Mm -hmm. Android apps. I integrated the link to to Podchaser right away in the website, and I'm trying to uh, integrate it also in in like asking for reviews for the podcast uh, to do that on Podchaser because it makes sense. It just makes sense. Uh, while doing my research for for this show, I found um, uh, somebody that said. Pot Chaser is the new epicenter for podcast appreciation and discovery, and I like that epicenter thing. It's so epic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's kind of that's kind of how we we like to view ourselves. Is uh, I think epicenter is a great word. I always say that we're the backbone of data for the industry um, because we we hope to. So we have this we have this website. We're currently not building a listening app. We think there are lots of great listening apps out there, but because we're collecting all of this great ratings and review data, what we want to do is share that data with, and, and credits. So we're the, we're the first company that has collected credits on the scale that we have for things like hosts and producers and editors and voice actors and composers and guests. Um, we want to make that data open and accessible to all of our partners. So that's why I always say that we're the backbone of data because We're, we're kind of just like a central database that everybody can access and use. So like if you open up the Player FM app today, you can see Podchaser ratings and Podchaser credits on every single podcast and episode page. If you go to like Radio Public and search for any of the popular shows, you'll see Podchaser ratings right there on the page. So 
we hope to make that more of the universal rating solution um, for the entire industry because we think that it'll take everybody working together to make that happen. There have been many podcast apps um, and platforms in the past that have tried to add ratings to their product. And the problem is there are just so many different places to listen to podcasts that if everybody tried to implement their own rating system, uh, first of all, all podcasters would just continue saying rate and review on Apple because it's not like you can list 12 different places to go rate your show and, and expect people to actually do it. So we think it just makes sense to have one solution and just say, wherever you listen to your podcast, leave a rating and then we can collect, Podchaser collects and distributes all that data. How did you come up with that? Where, where does this observation that something like this is missing in, in the industry come from? We had the same idea. You know, we thought like, this is obvious. Why, why isn't somebody doing this? And the same with credits. It's like, it makes so much sense to follow a person and see whenever they have a new guest appearance on a show, you should be notified for that because you shouldn't. So there's this idea of subscribing to a podcast, but if you're a really big fan of somebody who doesn't have a podcast and they're just a frequent guest on different podcasts, there's no way to follow what they're doing unless you, you know, keep up with their Twitter feed or something and just hope that they post their new guest appearance. So whenever, whenever our team first started building this, um, we asked ourselves the same question. We were like, is this so obvious? Why, why doesn't like an IMDB for podcasts exist? Or why isn't there like a rating solution? And I think as I've, as I've come to learn more about the industry over time, it's, I think the fact that we do not have a podcast, like uh, an app, a listening app, um, really works to our advantage because that means that we can work with anybody and they don't view us as a competitor because yeah. if any of the single companies in the industry tried to build a ratings or credit solution and then tried to push it on everybody else, like if Spotify came out with ratings and they're like, okay, now all of the other apps, all the other Android apps have to use Spotify ratings or this is what you should use. Um, they, uh, many of them view, view Spotify as a direct competitor. So why would they be, why would they implement ratings for Spotify? Why wouldn't they just do their own thing? Um, but it's hard to do their own thing. So we think it just makes more sense to have, um, you know, make Podchaser a data company or a database and work, work in the background. And yeah, you can go to Podchaser and leave ratings and reviews and follow people, but we want you to be able to do that everywhere and, and surface the data that we're, we're collecting on whatever, whatever app, um, whatever app you prefer to use, you know, we don't, we don't care when you go to any podcast page on Podchaser, including, including this one, um, you can, there's a, there's a button right on the page that says app. You click on that button and then you can open up that episode and whatever listening app you prefer. You know, we don't, we don't tell people you have to listen on Podchaser. Um, we just don't think, we don't think that makes sense. We think that the podcasting from the beginning has been a very open ecosystem and we, we want to keep it that way. Okay, I think that's a, a good notion because um, this the whole thing, the whole industry seems to move into a direction that is focusing on commercializing, um, monetizing, uh, which is important because a guy's got to eat. But somehow you you lose the, the the easiness, the openness, the collaboration type of thing, that exchange of information and helping each other uh, of this say initial <laughs> the initial 15 years of podcasting yeah and i think i think there's there will continue to be innovation in how people make money from doing a podcast i think that many podcasters out there are satisfied with not making any money because it's more of a of a passion project or it's a way to uh, just connect with other people in their industry which in an indirect way can help them make money through you know, through their business or through their job or whatever. But yeah, I mean, there's, there's innovation every single day about how people can make money from podcasts. And I hope that, I hope that those innovations continue to happen because I, anytime, anytime there's innovation in how people can make money in, in podcasting, it's just going to draw more people to do it. So we hope that podcasting continues to grow at the pace that it has over the last, you know, five, 10 years. Mm. I think it's obvious that it's going to, to grow a lot longer. Uh, if you look at, for example, NPR, they didn't do podcast for a long time. They actually opposed podcasting. And uh, now it's it looks like it's one of their major strategies to move um, radio to podcasting to have some sort of 
on-demand radio solutions uh, that allows people to binge listen uh, to shows that allows people to maybe interact better with uh, with the shows and with the people that created the shows also. So so I, it's obvious that things are happening. You take Gimlet. Gimlet is a, a, a special example also I think as a broadcast uh, podcast producing company uh, it's just perfect what they did what they built up and then they they were able to to uh, to also um, scale it heavily um, so that that's kind of a good thing I I think per personally because it's sort of in every industry you need something that drives the industry that uh, uh, creates inf innovation that uh, creates a buzz around the thing, so that um, that uh, the small guys, like for example, this podcast, gets also some attention because people are aware of the new thing. And, and you know, for us, it's been great because companies like Gimlet and Anchor, who both recently sold to Spotify, it, it justifies more investment in the space. So, uh, venture capital firms and angel investors who are thinking about podcasting, you know, they see these companies go from uh, nothing to selling for $200 million in, in you know, a few short years. And I think that uh, that just instills some confidence in, in the podcasting industry and encourages more companies to innovate and join the space and see the potential mm -hmm. um, for the future. Uh, you have incorporated Podchaser in uh, 2016. You have probably been working on it for quite a while before. So this is like your fourth or fifth year yeah well so we kind of in 2016 i would say january 2016 i think was when we really kind of brought the whole team the whole co-founder all the all the four co-founders that are still on the team today uh that's whenever we started really working on it more seriously and we all had full-time jobs so this was just a nights and weekends thing and by that summer of 2016 uh, we had released kind of the beta version of Podchaser, which looks nothing like how Podchaser looks today. It was pretty ugly, but nevertheless, there was, I think, within the first month, almost 7,000 people sign up. So we saw there's a, there's a need for this. People want it. And so then uh, we continued building some stuff, and then we were able to raise uh, a little bit of money that winter. Yeah, I would say 20, 2016 was kind of when we when we started with Baby Steps. 2017 was when we really started to to take off and then 2018 and 2019 it's been you know full steam ahead on trying to grow as as fast as possible do you have any like any specific high and a specific low on that journey of these past 3 or 4 years oh yeah lots of lots of both every day <laughs> <laughs> you know they always people warn you whenever you get into the startup world it's like you know, 99% fail or, you know, whatever, whatever the statistic is, you know, most, most startups fail, most startups fail to, to raise money or to grow, or the, there's tension between the co-founders or, you know, there's, there are all sorts of reasons, um, why, why companies fail. Um, but I think that fortunately for us, we've had a really great chemistry, um, just among our team. We have a really great, uh, our, our four, our four co-founders are really great. We get along really well. We have from the beginning. Um, so that's, I think worked in our favor, but specific, a specific low would probably be just the fundraising process and being just totally uncertain if we would be able to raise enough money to keep going because there have been moments, um, in the past, even like, you know, a few months where it's like, I don't know, I don't know if we're going to be able to do this. I don't know if, if, uh, this this company's actually or this VC is actually going to commit to to giving us the money that we need to justify having everybody working full time on Podchaser, and we have to question like you know we had I had conversations with um, with our other co founder about like what what would we do if we had to shut down Podchaser tomorrow? It's like we have uh, we have I think seven people working full time now, and these are all people who have. Uh, you know, quit quit really stable full time jobs and have put their confidence in us to be able to raise the money needed to to feed their families because they have children. You know, it's like it's just a very stressful, um, a very stressful thing. So those those are some low points when there's just so much uncertainty that you don't know what's going to happen next, and you just have to 
kind of sit back and hold on and <laughs> just continue working hard and hope for the best. And fortunately for us, you know, it's, it's been okay. Um, so we were able to, we we're able to raise the money and everything's, everything's good to go for the next few years, which is great. Um, but yeah, that's, that's probably been the toughest thing. I think that the highs always come when, uh, people, people recognize the work that we've done and, and they, appreciate what we've built. So like today, for example, I woke up this morning and we were featured in a business insider article. Um, as out of six companies, we were the first listed company of places to discover new podcasts. I've and seen so, the article. Yeah. So stuff like that, you know, that's just really reassuring. Um, and it, it just, uh, gives us confidence to keep, keep building what we're building. And, um, we hope to see, hope to see more of that. I think that we've had a pretty a hard time, getting press. Um, and I think some of that just has to do with, uh, we're like, you know, our, our co-founders, all of our founders, none of us, none of us have done this before. None of us have raised money. None of us have built a startup. This is all a first time thing for us. So it's a, it's a total learning experience. And, um, on top of that, we're, I'm from Indiana and one of our other co-founders is from Kentucky. And those aren't exactly places you would think to go to like raise, money for a startup, you know, you would, you would think New York, San Francisco, that's where all, that's where all the money is. LA, um, Austin, Texas, you know, that's where, where all the startups are. So that, you know, it has been a learning curve too. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's, it's been great. Um, and we've, we've learned a lot. I understand that you and Bradley, you are all time friends, but, um, your other co-founders, you have found via Reddit, via a Reddit forum. So that's kind of a crazy thing also, I think. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was pretty crazy too in the beginning. Um, so Bradley posted to Reddit just asking if something like this existed. And Ben, uh, was, who's our CTO, um, responded and was like, nope, it doesn't exist, but uh, I might be able to help you build it. And then, uh, you know, they, they connected and Ben's, one of Ben's relatives is also a really great designer. So he designed the whole website. Um, but yeah, I mean that, that Reddit thread still exists today. Uh, and part of how we initially even grew pod chaser was just posting to Reddit and saying like, Hey, we're building this thing. Sign up if you think it's worth, um, if you think it's worth your time. And that's how we got, you know, our first like 7,000 users. So yeah, it really all came from just the online podcasting community. And there are so many different places online that podcasters and listeners sort of congregate. Um, you know, Facebook is really popular. There are a lot of like different communities about audio drama or true crime or, you know, whatever you're interested in. I'm sure there's a Facebook group for it, but yeah, Reddit, Reddit has been great. There's a really active podcasts community. There's also R um, slash podcasting, which is really great for podcast creators. There's a lot of really good discussion. Um, on creating a podcast there. So that's how, that's how we initially got plugged into the community and how we met a lot of people, even outside of our co-founders. You took a completely different route by accident um, to meet up. It was basically what, you, what brought you together was um, a simple question, a simple observation um, in, a, in a, an environment that shared the same passions podcasting yeah it was just very lucky it was serendipitous you talk a lot about passion what, what, what is what is passion for you in in this say pot chasing uh, context so i've been listening to podcasts for a, a pretty long time um you know for i don't know maybe like eight or nine years Uh, podcasting, you know, it really became a thing like in 2007, 2008, and then kind of had a dip in popularity and then a resurgence in like 2013, 2014, it really started to pick up steam again. Um, and just from the beginning, I had a lot of frustrations as a listener because I, I don't make a podcast myself. So as a listener, I was really frustrated with discovery and searching for topics and things that I was interested in and not, not being able to do it. And there's really nowhere to do it. There's no good place for discovery. And especially at the time you go to like the Apple podcast charts and the top 10 business podcasts are completely predictable, always the same. 
And it, it was hard to just discover any new content. So you had to rely on existing content that was out there and just, uh, you know, hope that maybe you would stumble across a blog or somebody who would share something with you via like word of mouth. And, you know, there was no way for me to follow, you know, people that I was interested in in the podcast space. So it really, you know, I, I think the passion is a good word, but probably frustration more than anything, even today with a lot of the stuff that we're building, we build it because we're annoyed and we're frustrated with the current <laughs> infrastructure of the podcast space. And it's like, it should not be like this. And, you know, we, we feel so strongly that it shouldn't, that it shouldn't be like that, 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 uh, you know, it, it kind of fuels us to, to build, build new things and how we think it should look. Mm -hmm. um, with HTML, I think we are at HTML five dot something right now. That means there's, there has been quite some advancement since the beginning, say in the mid of nineties, early nineties, basically in terms of podcasts, where are we? What version are we right now? What do you think? <laughs> yeah, well, if you compare it to things like radio and TV, you know, just in the amount of time that other media has been around um, and just comparing that to the time that podcasting has been around, like maybe 10 years, a little little longer than 10 years, uh, we're, we're still by that definition in the early stages. I think that I think that we've kind of hit version two at this point, like version one of podcasting, you know, 10, 15 years ago, it looked very different than version two, um, how it exists today. And then I think version three tomorrow is going to look very different. And that's, I think Podchaser is trying to fit squarely right into version three. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think so too. Uh, there's uh, so much potential in, in this in this platform idea, in this um, the possibility to integrate in basically every other podcast service or app or whatever that is around, uh, that is it, the potential is just huge. I think um, one of these really nice things that you just added is the feed. You talk a lot about uh, discovering new podcasts, and I think the feed is something that is actually a, a very very first step to really help you discover these podcasts how does is that feed created how is my feed created for example i i set up my favorite podcasts uh list i i uh, i do rate some podcasts also stuff like that is there anything else that what's the secret sauce yeah so it's it's kind of funny how the feed the idea for the social feed started because we have we have a dedicated uh slack channel internally uh called hype and Anytime anybody like rates something or reviews something or follows something or creates a new list, it goes to this hype channel. So our team is notified about it and we know, we know what's happening. So in the beginning, it was like we would be anxiously watching this Slack channel and somebody would leave a, leave a four-star rating for a podcast. And it was like, oh, that's so exciting. You know, we're, that's so cool to see people actually actively participating on Podchaser. And so we actually started discovering new shows and seeing content show up in our own internal Slack channel. And we're like, this is all really interesting. Like we, mm -hmm. we have one place where we can see all of the reviews, all of the activity happening on Podchaser, all the lists being created um, in one place. And, and we're so obsessed with it. We thought like, why not expose this data and make it so that everybody can see everything that's happening on Podchaser all the time. So if you go to like the popular feed, on on the home page that's that's a, a real-time update of new activity that's happening on Podchaser. so like i just refresh the feed i see somebody rated a podcast five stars i see somebody followed two podcasts and you know these are these are podcasts i've never heard of so it gives it gives these podcasts an opportunity to reach a new audience and it gives listeners a way to kind of have a voice because you know that anything that you do on Podchaser, unless you have your privacy setting switched so it doesn't show up in the feed it's going to show up so that everybody can everybody else can discover that um those those same podcast episodes uh or podcasts that that you like too so that's the, that's the popular feed so you can see everything that's happening on podchaser all the time but then you also have just to the right of that a tab that says my feed so you can see uh you could you can personalize it based on uh, based on what you're interested in. So like you can, you can follow podcasts on Podchaser, which is essentially the same as 
as subscribing to them. So anytime they release a new episode, it'll show up in your personal feed. But you can also follow things like other users. So if there's if, if one of your friends is on Podchaser and uh, you see that they have an account, you can follow them. And anytime they leave a rating or review or create a new list or follow something, that's going to show up in your personal feed. Um, you can also follow podcast creators and creators includes guests. So like you can, you can go to my, my profile and you can follow me. And anytime I'm a guest on something, um, that's going to show up in your feed. So if there's, you know, a celebrity that you really like or, or a, an athlete or somebody who's a frequent guest on podcasts, you can search for their name and follow them and, uh, and see, see all their new guest appearances, which is, which is really unique. There's really nowhere else to do that for all the creators out there today. And then you can also follow lists. So we have a lot of really popular lists that have a decent number of followers. So like there's, there's, for example, um, a list of ongoing audio dramas and, people follow that because there's, there's a, one really active user on Podchaser who spends a lot of time curating a list of all of the most recent, re, recently released audio dramas. So you can see what's, what's new. So anytime that list, you can follow that list. And anytime that list is updated, you see an update in your personal feed. So it's really this like combination of all sorts of stuff. So instead of just like opening your podcast app and seeing new episodes that are released, you can start to see creator appearances, uh, user activity, list activity. Um, and then very soon we're going to in start inserting recommendations based on the things that you're rating, based on the things that you follow on Podchaser. You'll see, uh, you know, based on, based on your, uh, based on your review of this, you need to listen to this. You know, it's sort of like you open up Netflix and it, and it tries to use your preferences to recommend content. You know, we're going to, we're going to start to do the same thing um, probably in the next month that's going to be released. So on every podcast page and within your personal feed, you'll get totally personalized uh, recommendations for new shows to listen to. So it's just a really great, great discovery tool that we hope it continues to be adopted. You know, we see more people making accounts every single day just to participate. So it's exciting for us. I've seen that you have reached the number of 3 million credits on Podchaser. So that means that there's a, a lot of active users uh, using Podchasers very, very intensely. Yeah. Uh, so those, those credits come from a few different sources. And, and one of the main sources is just users. So most people don't know that websites like IMDb 99% of the data that you see on IMDb, like all the ratings, all the reviews, all of the like uh, special tidbits, information about a show or about a, about a TV show or a movie, it's all user generated. So those are all just very active, um, active users who are super fans of that movie or that TV show that just go on there to contribute because they love it so much. And so we have a lot of people on Podchaser who are, Exactly the same. You know, we have uh, people there. There's, I'm sure somebody can uh, adding credits to a show uh, right now, you know, as, as we're recording this podcast, I see. Yeah. Within the last few minutes, three new creator profiles were made for people that we didn't have in our database. So uh, that's, yeah, that, I mean, we, we couldn't do it without, without users being so, so active because there's no way that we would have the funds or the resources to, keep up with all of this ourselves. Mm -hmm. I remember Yahoo started like that. And uh, there was something also the open internet um, catalog or something, uh, which was also integrated into Yahoo. And that was a categorized catalog of all the internet with all the links uh, curated by people. That was the very beginning of, let's say, in, in 92 or something of Yahoo. Uh, and it, <laughs> the internet quickly grew exponentially and people couldn't come up or cope with the, 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 the lots of, of uh, information anymore. And that was the, uh, the point when uh, the search engines uh, came up that sort of automatically picked up these things and dramatically lowered also the quality of the results at first. Um, so do you have any plans here? Because I know you are a startup right now and... Um, You're well on the way, I think, and you have a great product. How will you cope with that, let's put it that way, hopefully giant uh, growth rate of podcasts? Um, that, that's something that we have to think a lot about because, first of all, just with all the people submitting credits, 
uh, there's potential for abuse. So like you can, you can submit credits for anybody, for any podcast, and it's not going to automatically appear on the podcast page because we, we moderate and verify every single new credit that comes into the database. So we have a team, we have a data team that is constantly reviewing every new credit that's added to Podchaser. So um, I think that the way that we're, the way that we're looking at that sort of rapid growth is first of all, like it's a great problem to have. Like if we're, if there are people (laughs) abusing the system, like that means that we're doing something right because that means that it's a system that's worth being abused. So, so I think that that's just really reassuring more than anything. Um, But yeah, I think that we, we think a lot about, things like moderation and content curation and deciding where to expose uh, things like, you know, if you leave a review that has like curse words in it or, you know, link to extreme, a link to extremely inappropriate content and that shows up on our homepage, you know, that's, that's bad. (laughs) That's, that's, it looks bad for us. You know, we have to, we have to think about things like that um, all the time. So I think that we, we just will have to be continue to be proactive about it, but, you know, I'm sure as we grow, you know, we're, we've had experience with people doing things like ratings manipulation. So they make a bunch of fake accounts and just give a bunch of one star or five star reviews to a show. And it's like, you know, we're able to catch it, um, it but it happens. And I'm sure it happens on iTunes, on Apple all the time. And it's just something that, you know, we have to have to live with. And hopefully as we grow, we'll have the resources to, uh, you know, just build better tools to track that sort of thing somebody's always trying to game a system it's it yeah. must be a sport or something maybe there's a special trophy for that also <laughs> yeah yeah well the special trophy you know it's uh it, it makes sense because like if you could show up on pod chasers uh top rated podcast page like thousands and thousands of people see that page so you'll get you'll get new listeners but on the other hand like you're going to get listeners that don't make sense for you because they they're discovering your podcast through illegitimate means. So they're going to find your podcast and listen to it. And they're, th- those people are likely to give you a one star because they're, they're thinking, why is this podcast so highly rated? That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Or, um, you know, it, it's, and it can go the opposite direction too. We've had abuse where, you know, there are just people who make accounts and rate something one star repeatedly to try to take down a competitor or something. And, you know, if, if you're spending your time uh, trying to grow by taking down your competitors, then I, I don't think you're going to be successful in the long run anyway, because your energy really needs to be focused on just making Creating better good. content. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Telling good stories, uh, improving your audio, audio quality, uh, talking to great guests uh, such as you are. you constantly um evolving uh pot chaser uh, uh and that's that's very normal is there any anything any method that you like to use any 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 book that that helped you a lot to start uh your production process your your product management or evolvement process your product development process i <laughs> it's funny i i uh i consume a lot of uh, media content. And I see myself as like an avid reader, but I don't read a lot of like hardback books. I don't, I don't read a lot of books and I wish I want, I want to read more books. Um, but whenever I read, you know, I see, I see is even like browsing a helpful, uh, Reddit thread. Like you're still, you're still reading, you're still consuming, you know, content that is, uh, coming directly from, you know, a, a business owner, that is providing helpful information. So like I'm on, I'm on Reddit a lot, looking at the startup community, looking at the entrepreneur community, um, and, and just reading stories, success stories and, and, uh, failure stories of people who have done this before. So I think a lot of the knowledge has come just from that, you know, people on Reddit, especially are really good at aggregating the most valuable information that they find in books and just putting it in one place. So there's not, not really a book or a resource I can, I can point to specifically, but it's just actively being a part of communities like that and building trust in those communities so that you can ask questions and join the discussions. And I think that sort of communication and immediate feedback and, um, and, and information is just, uh, in my, in my mind, just as much or more valuable than 
a book that isn't going to change for, you know, 20 years. So it's always going to be the same information and not, there's not constant iteration like there is online with people fact checking each other and uh, coming up with counterpoints and, and doing, doing that sort of thing. I like that. I, I know books are updated once in a while, but just not as much or as often as, as uh, you, you just uh, said. Also, books are norm normally written by a person, by a team of people, and uh, that the way you describe, you add so much more, many point of views and additional information and stuff like that from around the world, which um, also includes a mix of culture, uh, which creates different point of views, uh, basically by definition. I like that. Thank you very much for that input. Um, so, so do you build with Podchaser a mix of Reddit, IMDB and not sure what else, but <laughs> it sounds like, uh, Reddit uh, has a big influence on, on you. Uh, also the, the, the way it, it, it's, it works. And I'm just trying to think of uh, what what the Reddit part could be on on Podchaser because some you integrated already some part of that of that. Yeah, I think we 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 pull a lot of the social aspects and, and some of the stuff that that we're building. I think will be uh, more familiar. You'll recognize it on on things like Facebook and Instagram and Reddit and a lot of social communities. So things like if you if you leave a review. Or if somebody, let's say somebody reviews this episode and it shows up in my feed. Um, right now, there's really no way for you to interact with that. You can also, you can leave a rating too, but that's a, that's about it. Um, so we're hoping to add uh, another another layer to that, to that with things like discussion threads and reactions to, um, to somebody's contribution. So you'll start to see a lot more um, like discussion style, like type. Uh, features that we're building so that you can do things like react to somebody's review or respond to them or give your feedback on something or as a creator, reply to somebody's review so that you as a creator can actually like engage with your listener audience um, based on, based on what they're saying about your show. So I think you'll start, you'll start to see more things like that, but then also like uh, you know, just within our specific um, category pages, you know, you can, you can become a top rated blank, you know, whatever, whatever category you're in podcast, just by asking for more ratings and reviews. So it's just like, it's just like, uh, you know, something that gets a lot of upvotes on Reddit or something that gets a lot of likes or retweets on Twitter, on Twitter. Um, it's, it's the same kind of the same content concept. And that's just one other way of making, popular, popular things rise to the top. And it's been really rewarding for the early adopters of Podchaser because they've been able to take, take advantage of that. And, and you can see like our top podcast page has kind of been the same for a while. And that's really because those are the podcasts that are most actively asking for ratings and reviews and most actively asking for ratings and reviews specifically on Podchaser. So they've been rewarded for that by you know, sitting at the top of the, of the leaderboards. I understand the mechanism. There is a reward for actions and input on the platform. And the, but the reward comes from another, it gives other benefits. Let's put it that way. If you're on the top of the list, people will see your podcast more often, will discover uh, the podcast much easier and stuff like that. With uh, Podchaser, you're looking at lots and lots of podcasts. You get lots and lots of user-generated reviews. Uh, you might be able to add some additional components and and um, uh, quality features or whatever into factor that into the calculations. But will there be at one point in time a the perfect recipe or the recipe for the perfect podcast coming from Podchaser. Will you be able to generate something like that? <laughs> I think, uh, yeah. And I think that's coming a lot sooner, um, sooner than you might think. And it's not going to be so much based on things like audio quality. It'll be more based on, uh, so I think I'll have to probably back up and kind of explain where we're hoping to go with this. So With the new money that we've raised, we're building what we're calling Podchaser Pro. 
And that will be a new tool for podcast creators and for, uh, and for listeners and for guests on podcasts. And it will be a way for them to uh, connect with each other. So for example, if you're looking for guests on your podcast, you'll be able to actively post that you're looking for guests and then we'll even recommend the perfect guests for you. So we'll say, this person was a guest on these seven other podcasts and they talked about these topics. So if you want to boost your audience by X percent, we recommend that you have this guest on because they have this many Twitter followers and they're going to share it. And so we'll be able to start connecting people in a way that's smarter. And so you don't have to directly email people anymore, or just DM them, DM somebody on uh, Twitter, Instagram, and just hope that they respond. We're hoping to just kind of put the pieces together because we have this really unique data set of credits. We're the only place that has that uh, database of credits. And so we hope to leverage that to sort of make, I guess the best parallel would be like a LinkedIn um, for podcasting so that you can message other creators and collaborate and say that you're looking for like a new producer for your show. You can, you, you'll be able to say, I'm looking for a new producer. And then people will be able to apply to that role with their creator profile. So you can see all of their past work and the other things that they've helped produce. Or if you're an audio drama and you're looking for a voice actor, you'll be able to put out a casting call and say like voice actors apply here and they can submit their creator profile with samples or snippets of, of their past work. So you can easily filter through people and, and choose who you think would be the best fit for, for that role. So that's coming, that's coming next year. That's coming hopefully as soon as, as soon as, as soon as next summer with kind of a first, um, the MVP of that, just the first iteration of what Podchaser Pro will look like. And we're really excited for it because I personally would love to use it to be a guest on more podcasts, to talk to more people and connect with more people. And, um, we think that that's a really underserved part of the industry. So the first step to this recipe of the perfect podcast will be finding the perfect guest, the perfect collaborators, the perfect producers and, and stuff like that, where, and you will be offering something very soon to, to, to do that, to help me with that. Yeah. And we'll, we'll also be assigning a sort of score to somebody based on the amount of like, I guess, quote unquote, uh, influence they have. So like, we'll be able to take measures like their social media following or the other podcasts that they were on. So if somebody was a guest on the Tim Ferriss show, um, you know, that's going to, that's going to boost their score to be pretty high. So that might be a tougher person to get on your show, but uh, you know that they're very influential and they they would be a great guest to have because, because of the other shows that they've been on. So we're going to use things like, like our own data and data from all of our partner platforms to uh, start to collect all mm -hmm. that. Cole, you started with your co-founders a new company some time ago, say three or four years ago. Um, so you started doing something that you had never done before, which is perfectly normal for a startup. Um, you do something, you fill a void that is definitely existing with uh, Podchaser in this startup, in this growing startup industry. Do you have um, the perception that there's also some rules that you break once in a while doing this? Um, or is it something that it's just the void that you're filling? Um, I think that right so far, we <laughs> I don't think have broken any of the like the commandments of podcasting. You know, I think that we uh, support the mission of, of podcasting and keeping it open and freely accessible. We, we support that pretty well, but, uh, I think that, I think that just with, because podcasting is so early, it requires sort of breaking rules all the time. And that is, I guess the way that I would just define breaking rules would be, uh, creating things that, that don't already exist and don't, don't necessarily support the existing infrastructure because we think that it's broken and we think that it could be better. So I think that breaking rules is, I guess, one way to look at it, but we just see it as trying to make improvements, <laughs> <laughs> trying to make things better. Um, yeah, I can't, you know, I, I actually wish, I wish I could think of like a really 
big rule that we broke that that I could that I could share with you, but I can't think of anything off the top of my head. <laughs> that might be something of to, that comes to your advantage because if you're not really breaking something, if you're building, if you're connecting, if you're bringing people together, if you're creating a community of people that are interested in your product, that have a passion for your product, that uh, that I think that creates much more energy uh, and and buy in for the product and and uh, allows people to use it much much simpler or easier and 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 have a positive view of of pot chaser. Um, it's not weighed down by something that it's lifted up. I think. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of products coming out or services that are really controversial. So like paid uh, subscriptions to podcasts, you know, that's very controversial today. And it's it's something where there's a lot of argument about it and there's a lot of uncertainty. And um, I think that with the things that we're trying to do, it is it is sort of breaking how the current system works. But I think the one thing the one thing that has kind of made that hard is there have been people in the podcasting space from the beginning and many of them see that there's a, there's a, there's a, I guess, right way to do things. Um, and, uh, seeing, seeing big innovations like, like pod is, uh, just kind of scare people sometimes it's like, well, we haven't always done it this way. So I don't know if that'll work. And, um, it takes sometimes a lot more convincing than I would like uh, to, to get people to adopt, what we're doing because we really do need buy-in from almost the entire industry to be successful because we need all of the apps working with us. We need the, all of the hosting platforms working with us. We need, uh, we need everybody and it's, it's going to be a collaborative effort. So getting everybody on the same page and working toward the same goal um, is not an easy thing. So there, you know, sometimes I envy the companies that are just kind of doing their own thing and they're a little more controversial, but, uh, I think that, yeah, this is the, this will be the path forward for us and we'll see whether or not it works. <laughs> mm. well, well, welcome to my world. I have come up with a list of the 11 most important or most often used sentences for not being innovative. And one of these is we have never done that before, like uh, to quote you. Um, and it's just something you have to deal with if you have If you're doing, if you're working in a space that has something in the market already, and uh, that's just one of these big advantages of a startup company to to create something new and with less friction, at least in the beginning, until you come up with a large team of people that, at some point of time, will end up saying some of these sentences also. Yeah, and it's a big reason why people are so. I, I don't think there's enough money being spent on podcast advertising. And I think the reason for that is just because it's new. They've never done it before. So the big companies who are just dipping their toes into podcast advertising aren't spending as much money as they still are spending on things like TV advertising. And they're asking questions like, well, uh, how, how can I measure the response from this podcast ad? And I wish the response could be, well, how do you measure the response on the $3 million dollars that you spent on that TV advertisement for the Super Bowl, or, you know, it, like it, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't do both things. You can't ask for that because <laughs> advertisers today are so used to like buying Google ads and seeing direct results on clicks. And, you know, it's, there are ways to be innovative and, and get better, better tracking for, uh, for podcast ad results, but it's never going to be as good as like a Google ad. Like you're never going to see exactly how many people saw it or exactly how many people clicked it or went to your website because of it. Um, but I think that, I think it's going to change over time because the reason why there's so much money still being spent on radio ads and TV and billboards that many companies, they know it doesn't work, but They've, they've been doing it for 40 years. So it's just part of their system. And they know the person buying those ads knows that it's going to please their boss uh, to do the same things that their boss did. And so we just have to get to a point to where the industry, the podcast industry has grown up enough to where uh, people are used to buying podcast ads. It's part of the regular thing that they do is they go out and they spend money on creating a podcast or they spend money on buying podcast ads. 
Um, and I, yeah, I think, I think unfortunately that's just something that we have to be patient for and something that will just take time. Uh, can we expect some, something in from Podchaser that uh, will help to solve that problem? Yes. And it might take a little bit longer, but it, it'll be part of that same Podchaser pro ecosystem. So you'll be able to connect with not only other people, but you'll be able to connect with companies or brands that make sense to work with. So if a company like, uh, you know, Audible or Casper mattresses or whatever, you know, wants to get on a certain uh, type of podcast, they'll be able to use tools on Podchaser to say, I'm looking for a podcast that's based in uh, Austin, Texas, that reaches at least 10,000 people that talks about these three different topics that has this sort of listener demographic and is charging about this range for podcast advertising. And they'll just be able to You know, it'll almost be like a marketplace for that, um, but more of just a way to connect podcasters mm -hmm. with brands that make sense for them. Because I don't, I don't think you need, um, I don't think you need a hundred thousand downloads to to partner with brands or to have advertisers. I think that if you can clearly communicate the type of people that are listening to your show, and those people are valuable to a certain brand, because even reaching a hundred people that are that are a very in a very specific niche, it could make sense for them to spend money advertising with you. So I think that uh, I'm hoping that that system that we build doesn't rely too much on the number of downloads that a podcast gets, but just more about the content that that podcast talks about and the guests that they've had on and the estimated reach maybe, but uh, that'll, that'll always be an important metric for some companies. So we'll, we'll have it, but I think that there are other equally important ways to connect advertisers with podcasters i bet your backlog list uh, of new features and feature ideas is very very long <laughs> and i really hope and wish you the best of luck to Podchaser um to create all these things that you that you envision because you're such a, a great tool for listeners as well as for creators alike i really love that Thank you very much for being part of this podcast, for taking your time for this conversation. Yeah, thanks for having me on. That was my conversation with Cole Raven, the co-founder of Podchaser, on this episode of the 2.5 Conversations Connecting Innovators podcast. You find all the links and a transcript on the website. Simply head on over to the 2.5.net. I'll add the link to the show notes. If you like the show, subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. I encourage you to use Podchaser for your podcast discovery. And while you're there, please leave a review for this show. You help others to discover the program. Simply head on over to podchaser.com slash the 2.5. A special thanks to Imix for creating the music for the podcast. The 2.5 Conversations Connecting Innovator podcast is hosted in Baden-Württemberg in Germany. My name is Klaus. Until next time, take care and keep on being innovative.